I have a son that's 10 years old. Well, no, actually, he's 11 years old now. And he's a hand little school. So I am in, interested in STEM education and know that he's extremely interested in STEM education. Uh, tonight, I want to talk to you about a resource that you may or may not know about that's available here in South Carolina that I think is probably one of the real gems in what we have to offer here in South Carolina. And the nice thing is it's set up and it is available for K through 12 education and uh, they actually have on-site K through 12 activities that um, are available if you want to take a field trip down and spend the day. The place I'm talking about is called Hobcaw Barony. And it's also the location of the University of South Carolina's Marine Field Laboratory, the Baruch Marine Field Laboratory, where we have scientists and staff uh, there full time, as well as people here in Columbia that spend a lot of time working down there like I do. It's located near Georgetown, and we've got uh, a nice little discovery center where uh, they have uh, picnic tables and a uh, facility for to hold meetings. Um, we have a uh, dormitories there for students to spend overnight. Uh, we have quite a few students that spend time in residence there, uh, mostly uh, undergraduate and graduate students doing research down there. We have our field laboratory located down here close to the edge of the park. And the estuary that's associated with the Hobcaw Barony is called North Inlet Estuary. And it's right adjacent to a very different type of estuary called uh, Winya Bay. And these are the two places where uh, I do a lot of my research. The property is administered by something called the Bell W. Baruch Foundation. And uh, they actually own and manage the property that's there. The United, uh, the State of South Carolina and Clemson University are there by invitation from the Hobcoff Baruch Foundation to have their facilities there and to use it for research, research and education. Um, the the uh, South Carolina, University of South Carolina arm of that is the Bell W. Baruch Institute for Marine and Coastal Sciences, and we basically are involved with things that are related to the estuary and the coastal waters in Hobcaw Barony. Clemson uh, is mostly uh, involved with forestry and management of the forest area. So it's one of those cases where USC and Clemson actually get along really well. We cooperate quite a bit uh, in our, our research activities down the coast. It's a pretty large area. It's about 25 square miles. And it contains a variety of different habitat types, anywhere from forests to uh, estuaries to barrier islands and even old rice fields that are left over from uh, the late 1700s, early 1800s, when this region was really responsible for most of the rice production in the world for several years, only second to India. It's on the National Historic Register and it's very well protected. It's uh, owned by the Baruch Foundation, and it is, uh, will be a preserve in perpetuity. It's isolated, and it's relatively undisturbed. And I like to tell people, I think, in my opinion, it's the most pristine salt marsh on the east coast of the United States. It's the cleanest one. It's the one that's the most natural that you will find on the east coast of the United States. And so it's a beautiful uh, example of the way things used to be or the way things should be in the future. It's devoted towards research, education, and conservation. Uh, there's a very interesting story about how Hobcaw was assembled by Bernard Baruch, who is a Wall Street financier. And uh, he basically uh, came down in the early 1900s and bought up several rice plantations to assemble, reassemble what was one of the land grants from the King of England. And he set it up mostly as a winter retreat for his family and friends. He would bring people down. They would do, go hunting and fishing and 
uh, celebrate Christmas uh, down at the uh, uh, Hobcaw House, which was built uh, to house those people. Uh, Bernard Baruch had a daughter, Belle Baruch, who spent much of her life at the <coughs> Hobcaw Barony, and he willed much of his property to Belle <coughs> Baruch. Belle Baruch passed away before her father did, and he went ahead and executed her will. And at that time, the foundation was set up, um, and in 1968, actually began to function as its own separate entity. But it's an interesting story, a lot of history behind uh, the property. We're known as the Bell W. Baruch Institute for Marine and Coastal Sciences. We're part of the School of the Earth, Ocean, and Environment and the College of Arts and Sciences here in Columbia at the University of South Carolina. Our three main foci are research, training, and informing the public. We uh, have many scientists that are very actively doing research down there. Uh, from very simple things to very complicated research projects. We are in the business of training our future marine scientists, uh, not only graduate students and undergraduates, but also K through 12. Uh, as I said before, there's a very strong education component uh, with this facility. And we want to inform the public. Scientific information is not very useful if it doesn't translate into something that is useful for the public. And we spend a lot of time trying to translate what we do into what it means for the future and for conservation and preservation of coastal habitats in the United States. This is just an aerial photograph. The actual field laboratory itself is located here. And we have a long pier here that uh, contains a meteorological station and a uh, salt water system pump so that we have flowing seawater in the lab. There's another little observation um, dock or pier that sticks out here that uh, we use for education purposes to take people out. And uh, it's really nice because it transects all the different habitats that you will see in a marsh estuary. Right now we have about 75 research and environmental projects that are ongoing and we I uh, have more than 120 faculty, not only from USC, but from other institutions. And we have, I'm a little too loud. And we have uh, several agencies that are involved with research uh, that's ongoing there. So it's a very active place for, for research. It's well utilized. We have 4,800 person days uh, in the use of the field lab in the last year. So there are a lot of people down there, and they're spending a lot of time. We have scholarships and visiting scientist awards to get more people down there. We have um, a variety of different uh, funding mechanisms to try to facilitate uh, involvement there. Uh, last year we had 26 college field trips from uh, USC and 11 other institutions. We have places up and down the East Coast that will come and take two or three days and come down for an actual visit uh, to the field lab, again, because it's such a great example of a pristine system. And we also have summer courses. Most of these summer courses are uh, geared towards uh, undergraduate and graduate students. We don't really have any K through 12 summer courses in place at this time. One of the um, required courses for all of our marine science majors is a field course where they actually go and are in residence for a month and they spend that time basically outside of the classroom doing the real business of science not sitting and listening to lectures and looking at slides but actually getting dirty and fighting mosquitoes and having fun catching fish and, and other things so it's a very uh, um, well attended and well liked class by the marine science uh, graduates, uh, undergraduates that um, take that course. It's also part of the National Estuary and Research Reserve. And that's very nice because they actually have money set aside for education and outreach. And this is the primary arm I think that most of you would be interested in. Um, they have K through 12 field trips, they have teacher training, 
a, a family event, so actually, they actually have um, um, outreach coordinators that visit schools and will bring information and bring animals and do uh, you know, experiments and demonstrations for students. They offer professional training workshops mostly for decision makers to try to bring them up to speed on what the state of the art is of the science behind what they're doing. And then we have stewardship where there are conservation programs and, and citizen science, educating the people about what we're doing. And then we have environmental monitoring and research and it's uh, the uh, data repository for 11 other research reserves around the country. All the data that's collected at other places is all sent to the University of South Carolina and housed in something that's called the CDMO or the Central Data Management Office. So uh, you have access to all the data that are collected at all these different sites if you uh, would like to do something. So a little bit of science now. Um, the Baruch uh, Marine Field Laboratory is located on North Inland. North Inland is an estuary, which means that the water is, um, seawater is measurably diluted by fresh water. So the salinity is a little bit lower than it is in the coastal ocean. But um, it is an enclosed area. It has a relatively high salinity because there's very little freshwater input into North Inlet. One of the nice things about North Inlet is almost the entire watershed for this estuary is owned by the foundation. So they control everything that comes into the estuary, which is why, I think, one of the major reasons why it's as clean as it is today is because there's been virtually nothing done in the watershed. About 90% of its watershed is natural forest. And it has outstanding water quality and habitat quality. I think it is the reference for other places. It's the thing that other people compare their results to because this is the way it should be. It's probably one of the most intensively studied and best estuaries uh, of its kind uh, since 1968. It's been um, studied intensively by people from the university as well as people from around the world, and we know quite a bit about North Inlet. There are also quite a few things we still don't know or understand, and there are things that are changing in the world today that we have no control over, and we're seeing those changes in the estuary. That can be contrasted with Winga Bay Estuary, which is mostly a freshwater system. And it gets its fresh water from about five <coughs> rivers that flow. Uh, the watershed reaches all the way past Charlotte. And the PD River flows down uh, to the coast where it eventually empties into Winyaw Bay. It's said to be the third largest estuary. Everybody says they're third largest <laughs> estuary. But uh, and that's based on watershed area, the area in which it covers. And so things that happen in watershed of South Carolina and North Carolina eventually make their way down and out through Wingall Bay. So it's a good place to study there for an impacted estuary. North Inlet has watershed that's got salt marshes and waterways. It has a coastal ocean um, and we study a lot about its geology, hydrology, chemistry, and biology. Some of the major research themes that we cover are uh, looking at the dominant plant that you see along the coast here in South Carolina. It's called the salt marsh cordgrass or Spartina alterniflora. And uh, it is what we like to call an ecosystem engineer. It is responsible for making the habitat the way that it is. And it's a very uh, integral part of, part of these systems. We look at how it grows, what its production is, what are some of the bacterial microbial processes that lead to that productivity that we see, and of course all plants need nutrients and the supply of those nutrients is going to determine how much productivity there is. So we like to understand the nutrient chemistry in these systems. We also have people that are looking at tides and waves and storms, things like sediment erosion and deposition. Uh, how the mud flats change over tidal cycles and over seasonal cycles, 
and how the creeks actually evolve. These creeks over time meander, okay, and they change their position. And understanding and predicting how these creeks change is, uh, is one of the research foci that we're working on. We do a lot with water chemistry and microbiology, looking at nutrients and bacteria, suspended sediments, the phytoplankton, the actual plants, that microscopic plants that live in the water column, and zooplankton, the little small microscopic animals that live in the water column. And these are just some pictures. The light lighting isn't very good, but that's a zooplankton there. That's actually a crab larva. will grow up into being an adult crab, and these are all tiny plant cells, phytoplankton, that are responsible for most of the food that things eat in the estuary. You think, all oh, that's Spartina, there's lots of food. Not many things eat Spartina. The primary food source are these little tiny microscopic phytoplankton in the estuary. We look at oyster reefs. Uh, I think everybody, well, most people like oysters. <laughs> and, uh, we in South Carolina have oyster reefs that are a little different than most other places. Our oysters grow intertidally, that is between high tide and low tide. Most other places they actually grow submerged, permanently submerged. So South Carolina and Georgia and a little bit of northern Florida, the only places you really find is intertidal oyster reefs. And we've done a lot of work on them. They're pretty uh, abundant in North Inlet. And not really affected by any pollution, so they're good model systems to look at. Uh, we look at fish, of course, the <coughs> animals that live in this system, and uh, how they use these different habitats and how they change over time. We have a new addition to one of our toys. It's a, I call it the blimp, but it's actually a, called a helikite, and it's a balloon that you can basically uh, send up into the air, and under the bottom of that balloon, we have a variety of different instruments in it. So we can do a lot of things uh, looking at spatial changes and uh, changes in vegetation over large areas using this helicopter. So a very useful uh, tool. This is just one of the images that's taken. It's enhanced to show the really green stuff here is the Spartina, and this is a different um, lower density Spartina here. There's been a lot of environmental monitoring in North Inlet. There have been long-term measurements there almost continuously since 1980. Okay, it's 2016 now. That's a long time to continuously measure information. And it's extremely important nowadays because we know things are changing and we need to understand what is changing and what its effects are. And so having these long-term data sets are really useful. More than 100 things have been measured, and just a list there of uh, all the different types of things that are measured routinely, almost continuously, since 1980. There's a huge database for North Carolina Estuary. Uh, we have a meteorological station there and a water quality station there, and uh, this is the MET station. This is a rain collector. Uh, there are a lot of pollutants and rainfall. There are a lot of nutrients in rainfall. And we actually make measurements of those because those are nutrient inputs into our estuary. Um, just some variables here that are plotted on graphs. This is available in real time on the web. You can sit in your office and click a button and know exactly what's going on at any time, weather-wise or water quality-wise in North Dillon or any of the other uh, estuarine research reserves. They have real-time data that are available. And uh, it's really cool, especially when a storm is coming through, to sit there in your nice, comfortable office and look at how strong the wind is and what the water level is at, at North Inland. So I'm a scientist, so I have to present some data. And I'll try not to bore you too much with this. But one of the things that we've noticed is uh, El Nino has a profound effect on the estuary. El Nino, the southern oscillation, happens out way out in the equatorial Pacific. And it's basically when a warm pool of water moves to the eastern side of the Pacific and alters global weather patterns. We can see that even in our estuary. And what we're looking at here is salinity, or how salty the water is over a, long, over a long time period. And these places where we see these spikes where salinity is much, much lower 
are El Nino years. Those are years in which El Nino occurs. And it's pretty well known that the effects of El Nino here, one of the effects, are higher than normal rainfall. And we see that reflected in our data for North Inland Estuary. And by the way, if you haven't been following the news, the 2015-16 El Nino uh, is either the second or the largest El Nino event ever recorded. And uh, I just heard a lecture on that last week. And it's amazing, uh, these El Nino events seem to be getting more intense, and we link it to things like global warming. Everybody remembers the October floods. And here in Columbia, you know, after a couple of weeks, most of the water drained away. My basement dried out after a couple of weeks. And if we look at what the impacts were on the estuary, this is what it looks like normally. Salinity is changing, so it's variable, but not really hot. Then we had this October rainfall, and for this entire period, all the way up through the early April, we were still seeing impacts of that rainfall in our system. And it wasn't until early this summer that the system got back into being what was a normal pattern. So even though it was just a one, you know, one day event here, really, it had long-term implications for what we see in the estuary. Water temperature, okay, global warming. Uh, I like to tell my students it's a fact. It's not something that you can argue about whether or not it's occurring. It's occurring. And anybody who says it isn't is either fooling themselves or, or, they, or they don't believe the truth. And we see that here in the North Inlet data. Okay? This is our long-term water temperature record. And it is showing, uh, there's lots of variation between years, but if we look at the long-term trend, it's getting warmer by about uh, two degrees since 1980. It doesn't sound like much, but for things that live in the estuary, that two degree difference is extremely important. Along with that, we've seen long-term decreases in zooplankton, the little animals that live in the water column. And zooplankton are incredibly important because bigger things eat smaller things. And if there's less food around, there are less bigger things. And so if you look at, uh, we've had this reduction, and if you look at things that eat them, anchovies, okay, a huge decrease since 1981. Okay, a big decline. And this is an is in an estuary that's not being polluted or overfished or overutilized by other people. Uh, I talked about zooplankton. Are they declining? If we look at the long-term trend here, that also is declining. Okay, long-term declines in uh, zooplankton. What about fish? If we compare 1981 to 84, the clear bars right here, the white bars, and compare that with 2012 to 2015, it's pretty easy to see. There's a lot less here than there used to be. And the fishermen will tell you that. I don't catch as many fish as I used to. And it's not just simply because it's being overfished. The system is responding, uh, we think, to global change. Another thing that's happening is sea level is rising. Polar ice caps are melting. We're adding more water to the oceans. The oceans are coming up uh, at the rate of about a centimeter or so per year. And oops, if we look at data, this shows mean sea level rise since about 1920 in Charleston, which is basically the same as North Carolina. Sea level is rising. So the big question is, how do marshes respond to that sea level rise? We've had sea level rise a lot over history. Um, uh, at one point, the beach was... 75 miles east of Charleston, and another point, the beach was all the way here in Columbia. So sea level changes, that's not new. What is new is that it's changing faster than it ever has. And the problem is that ecological and biological systems cannot respond as quickly as they need to to this rising sea level. And one of the things that doesn't respond very well is salt marshes. Like I told you earlier, this was the engineer for that system, and it's responsible for many of the properties that we see there. But the problem is, 
that it can't grow fast enough to keep ahead of sea level rise. And so it gets drowned, okay, and dies, okay? It's not rising as fast as sea level is, and so what we're doing is we're taking our salt marshes and turning them into lagoons that don't have any spartina vegetation. And that has very negative implications for these estuaries. Um, well, you know, if things don't change, uh, one of the predictions is North Inlet's going to look something sort of like this, as opposed to what I'm going to show you here in a video in just a minute. So we still don't understand what the long-term impacts of global change are going to be. And that's one of the things, one of the uh, primary focus areas for people at, at North Inlet. We don't know what the impacts are going to be on commercial fisheries. Man, I love shrimp. But if we don't have food to feed shrimp, shrimp won't be there. Shrimp utilize the marsh. If the marshes disappear, the shrimp won't be there. Okay? It's extremely important. In addition to all these climate changes we're having, there are more and more people living at the coast. And we're populating larger and larger areas. People make pollution, and that pollution ends up in the environment and has negative effects on those systems. And so um, this is just another stress that our coastal ecosystems are under nowadays. So what we really want to do is to try to discover and provide the information necessary to try to maintain a healthy balance in this system. Education is the key. There's only so much I can do as a scientist. I mean, I can collect data, but I can't bring about policy changes or changes in people's attitudes. That comes through education. And that's the role, the critical role, I think, that you folks play is starting at an early age and letting these budding young scientists and budding young politicians know that we have a problem and we need to do something about it. Um, we need to educate K through 12. We need to educate the teachers. And the organizations, uh, citizens and organizations need, need to be kept up to date. And uh, as well as consultants and government agencies and other decision makers. There needs to be a flow of information. We can't just collect data and put it in a cabinet. So, uh, before I show the little quick video here, I've got a few demos here. It's kind of hard to bring uh, the marsh into the classroom. <laughs> but I brought a few things up here, and you can feel free during dinner or after uh, the talks to come by and take a look at it. And uh, I can demonstrate how some of these work. But this is uh, a water sampler. And you basically lower it down into the water column. And it automatically closes, so you can collect water at any depth you want to. Uh, so if I wanted water from 10 feet down, I can collect that mass of water and bring it to the surface. Uh, this is a plankton net that we use to catch plankton in. It's, uh, this is a kind of a small one, but uh, you pull it through the water and it filters the water. All of the animals and plants are caught in this little bucket at the end um, of the net where the uh, it also filters water, so when you get through, you basically unscrew this and take your sample and pour it out and, and analyze it. Uh, this is a really simple tool here. It's called a secchi disc. It's got a lead weight on the bottom. It's white on the top. And you use this for looking at water clarity. You basically lower it down in the water column until you come to a point where you don't see it anymore. And that point is what's known as the secchi depth. And that is a good indicator of water quality in these systems. Um, I brought a refractometer. It's one of the simplest instruments we have for measuring salinity. And it does that by measuring the refractive index of water. And um, I brought along a little bit of seawater if some people would like to see what it looks like to measure salinity. Uh, we can do that. I have a handout here that gives you all the information if you'd be interested in taking a class down to the coast for a day. From Columbia, it's about a two and a half hour drive down, so it's easily doable in a day. You can go down, have lunch on the beach, um, and uh, spend some time. There are several different activities that are available depending on the age of your group and the size of your group, but it's definitely worth taking a trip down there, and the nearest coordinators are excellent 
I mean, this is what they do for a living. They're really good at K through 12 education. Um, I have a few business cards up here if you want to get in touch with me. And then I brought one of my hobbies here. These are little tiny shrimp. And they're made out of a soda straw. Okay? A little bendy soda straw. That you get. So be sure and pick up a few to take home with you so you can impress your friends with, uh, with some folk art. And um, with that, I'll try to answer some of your questions. So I'm going to start this video here. You can still ask me questions. This is just a video that was shot by one of the researchers down there. The new cool thing in science now is drones. Everybody wants a drone. And so he took his drone out and did some uh, video of uh, Crab Hall Creek there in North Inland. And uh, I really like it because it's, it's a very good picture of what that system looks like. Fishermen can come in, okay? They can't be because of state waters. But the, the thing that saves it is there's no easy way to get there. You basically have to come from the ocean side into the estuary. And so um, it doesn't get as much traffic as most other places. Uh, there has been in the past, but not recently. <laughs> Well, that's a boardwalk. We have lots of little boardwalks with little tiny things like this that you have to keep your balance on. And you can walk out and sample so we don't trample down the marsh every time we want to go out and collect some mud. Good. You can actually see some people walking there on one of the walkways. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, do y'all monitor um, of the aluminum content? Of the rainfall of the of March? Uh, there's a national program called Muscle Watch that goes around all of the United States and collects shellfish, mostly clams and oysters, and routinely measures heavy metal concentrations, including things like aluminum. We don't specifically only measure aluminum unless there's a, a question to do it. It's not really a cheap analysis, but. Uh, I had a graduate student who was interested in oysters and nanoparticles. And I don't know if you kept up with any of what's the big buzz now about nanoparticles in the environment, but she was interested in how these affect oyster feeding. As it turns out, it inhibits uh, oyster growth when these nanoparticles are present. And so we do have people that are working with those things, not so much measuring heavy metals. There's not much pollution in North Inlet and numbers that you get there would be what probably naturally occurs in these animals. This, this comment about like the hurricanes that go through, what's sort of the impact of the hurricanes that go through? Uh, 1989. Now let's see. 1989. Hurricane Hugo. Hurricane Hugo washed away the land. Okay? It washed it away. Uh, I happen to be doing my dissertation research down there at the time, and it completely blew away the lab. Luckily, FEMA came in with some money, the state came in with some money, and they built a brand new laboratory. This time, they built it up high, okay, <laughs> and further away from the marsh edge. But uh, about 1992 is when they opened the new laboratory, So, and it's a state-of-the-art facility with uh, teaching classrooms there. Um, all the equipment you might need, all the personnel that are there, boats, and um, it's a great place to go. All right. Well, we okay. have well thank you very much for having me, and uh, I am there to answer questions. If I can't answer it, I'm pretty sure I can find somebody who will answer your questions.